This is Bernie Dernheim, artist, rapper, yogi, anarcho syndicalist, witch doctor, joining you for the Soundside Academy. This is part two of the first class of Foundations in Art, Ethics, and Biology. Uh, this is a course that we're offering online for the first time. Please enjoy part two. Uh, we'll be back with part three very soon. Let's now get on to the course content. Let's talk a little bit about the course content. This is Foundations in Art, Ethics and Biology. Uh, it's divided into three areas, as the title would suggest. Those areas are the biological sciences, anarcho-syndicalist ethics, and it's something that we call practicing the art. Now, practicing the art involves all of the different aspects of the art of witch doctoring, which of course has certain things that you would find in many other art forms, like that you would associate with many other art forms. In fact, one of the one of the things that we reflect upon as witch doctors is the way that knowledge has been divided up into all of these different segments. And what we now know as art has been separated from the practices of healing, from ceremonial and spiritual encounters with other beings. Uh, it has been separated from what we call music. It has been separated from what we call science. And one of the things that we must do as witch doctors is to see the interconnecting tissue between all of these areas of knowledge and practice and bring them into our own practice. And so that's what we attempt to do. So the, the three areas that I'm talking about here of the biological sciences, anarcho-syndicalist ethics and practicing the art, we're all about breaking down or examining carefully how those distinctions might operate within this practice of witch doctoring and whether or not those distinctions might be useful. But clearly, we do need to draw from the knowledge of all of those different areas. So our class today is going to be an introduction to each of those three things, the biological sciences, anarcho-syndicalist ethics and practicing the art. Of course, the big question a lot of you may have is why do witch doctors need to study the biological sciences? Um, now, it's worth explaining here that a huge part of our practice as witch doctors is connecting to the spirits of plants, of animals, of fungi, of even the microbial world uh, that certainly in previous times we had very little insight into, but now through the wonders of, of, of modern biology, we can peer into the intricacies of microbial relations. And we can use that knowledge when we enter the psychedelic mind state uh, as part of our witch doctoring activities. So it is useful for us as witch doctors to be able to see how our activities of communicating with all of these other creatures, with all the other living creatures on this planet, including ingesting certain molecules that psychoactive plants contain, in including ingesting those molecules from the psychoactive fungi. All of that is a means of us communicating with those organisms. And we need to understand what science has to say about the communication between organisms and that's what we're going to be focusing on in that aspect of this course it's important for every witch doctor to have a grounding in the biological sciences that way we can more fully appreciate the depths of those more esoteric encounters that we have with other animals plants fungi and the spirit realm right we can more fully appreciate that from the perspective provided to us by the biological sciences. So that's why, that's, that's basically, that's a little rant on why witch doctors may wish to study the biological sciences. And we believe it's a fundamental part of any, uh, any, any integral course on the art of witch doctoring. Now, 
We can also, if we're thinking about why we might want to study the biological sciences now, we can also zoom out a little bit and take in the global picture. And that global picture is one of a warming climate. It is one of pandemics. It is one of ecological crisis. It is one where shit is fucked up, right? And shit is fucked up on an ecological level, on a global level. And we've done a lot of the fucking up of that shit as a species, right? So we need to think about coming to a new arrangement with all other living things if we are to survive and thrive into the future, which should be the goal, I believe, of all human beings is to come into a balance, a form of dynamic equilibria with our environment. Every other creature does that. We are currently not doing that. We're fucking up that balance. We're fucking up that dynamic equilibria within ecosystems all over the planet. We're taking what were once diverse climax ecosystems and we are simplifying them. We are wittering away millions and billions of years of evolution that has been embedded within the creatures in those ecosystems that is knowledge that will never be recovered we are destroying that genetic heritage we will not re recover that knowledge that is the situation that we're in so we've got to find a way to re-enter into that dynamic equilibria with the other living creatures on this planet and for that reason, it is useful to study what's going on in, in ecosystems. It's useful to study how shit got so out of whack with global warming, how we ended up in a situation where we had unprecedented fires burning through our conti continent during the summer of 2019, 2020. At the same time, I should say, as the global pandemic that is the COVID-19 situation at the same time as fires were burning through our continent, that virus was emerging in China to remind us that not only are our actions causing unprecedented disasters like the fires in Australia during the previous summer, but also our actions are contributing to the spread of diseases from other animals and it is largely d the destruction of habitat and their ecosystems that is driving these pandemics that are arriving on our shores. So how do we bring back the balance? Well, one way to bring back the balance is to reflect on our connections, much as I have been doing just there. Uh, we need to reflect on our connections to other living creatures. So here on the slide, we have an image of a bat that flies around in the skies here of the inner west of Sydney. This bat also forms the logo for the Sound Sight Academy. Uh, we're very thankful to the bats that surround us. We are in awe of their abilities to see through sound, to see with exquisite detail through their echolocation capacities. So that's one of the reasons why the bat is on our logo of the SoundSight Academy. Uh, we have included that because that's something that all witch doctors aspire to is the ability to see through sound in exquisite detail and to use those visions to bring about healing in the body. That's part of what we do as witch doctors. And we appreciate any creature that is able to do that. And certainly the bats are the ones that are nearest and dearest to us here in the inner west of Sydney. They are flying around right outside my window now as we speak and they have been somewhat persecuted as the likely source of the virus causing the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, 
we are here to stand up for the bats. We love the bats. We are in awe of their sensory abilities and we are connected to them through sound, through the sounds that we make as we move through the ecosystem that they are a part of, that we are a part of here on the river. We are connected to those bats through those sounds and part of our witch doctoring activities here actually in the inner west on the cooks river where we are now currently part of our witch doctoring activities is a mode of connecting to the bats of understanding their spirits and of feeling that connection embodied in our own bodies of attempting to know something of what the bat knows uh, that, of course, is an ancient aspect of the role of the witch doctor, is to tap into the knowledge of other living organisms and to use that knowledge for the purposes of healing. Okay, so we're all connected in this. Every single living organism shares the genetic code. We are all made of the same genetic stuff. And in some visionary moments, we might perceive that, in fact, we are all part of the same body, of this larger body that is the mother of all mothers, that larger body that goes throughout the universe, that larger body that brings about the dynamic equilibria of diverse ecosystems and that larger body that we are now affecting with our actions on this planet. So yes, we're all made of the same genetic material that includes the coanoflagellates, ancestors of multicellular life on this earth, little cells that can be, be single cells, they can live as single cells, and they can also join up into a multicellular form, which is what we did at some point. We were, we were individual cells that joined up into a multicellular form. Uh, we did that at some point. We made that transition. So those cells then could become creatures like bats, like ourselves, like all of the animals that we have around us. So these coanoflagellates, likely very similar to the origin of all multicellular animals. They are our ancestors and also our contemporaries on this planet they're still alive there with us right now um, one other image there is the of course of course these are the cyanobacteria right because the cyanobacteria are hugely important within the history of life on our planet they discovered the trick of turning the sun's energy into their bodies they did that before plants could do it. And in fact, they became part of the plant um, and their ancestors are now, or their descendants, I should say, are now inside of the cells of every plant on this planet. Okay, all of that is part of what the cyanobacteria have to teach us, right? Is this capacity to transform the planet on a, completely change its atmosphere. These were the source of the first great pollution crisis on this earth because before the cyanobacteria around were around, there weren't any organisms that were very good at dealing with oxygen. And as soon as they came along, they put oxygen into the atmosphere and caused the evolution of oxygen respiring organisms, of which, of course, we are a descendant also. So uh, the cyanobacteria, really important organisms. We are connected to them. We're connected to the coanoflagellates. We're connected to the bats. We're connected through all of these levels of life. Yes, we are connected, but how? Okay, so that's another huge part of this course is describing precisely how we are connected. And we're connected through chemicals. We're connected through the molecules that all species use to communicate with one another. When we ingest a psychoactive plant 
its molecules into receptors in our bodies and communicate something of their knowledge to the cells of our bodies. So in the case of the psilocybin containing mushroom, when we ingest that substance, when we ingest that mushroom, we are also ingesting a molecule that has the ability to find its way into our serotonin receptors and do all sorts of interesting things when it gets there right that molecule is psilocybin that's the molecule that they've been using to treat depression in many trials in the united states at the moment that molecule does very interesting things within the receptors within our body one of them is to reduce inflammation and we'll be discussing that in more detail in a future class we the psilocybin molecule can reduce inflammation and it can act as an immunomodulatory molecule that is to say it can dial down the immune response in certain situations when that is desirable such as when we have autoimmune conditions so okay one of the ways that we communicate with other creatures is through chemistry through the molecules that all species use to communicate with one another the other aspect of the biological sciences that we're going to cover in this course is how we go about making our homes with other organisms this is a process that is called domestication it deals with how species speak to one another really how they what 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 kind of deals that are species doing with one another involving food accommodation protection and grooming uh, there's many examples that we might point to here. One, of course, is the example of the co-domestication between wolf and human. What happened in that relationship that produced dogs, right? And it produced us as we currently are. That relationship where we traded our scraps, our food, for the protection provided by the canine uh, to our camps. And... In that way, we were able to make a home together and we entered into a relationship that changed the course of our evolution and of the evolution of the wolf. Okay, so this is one of those deals of homemaking that goes on in the natural world. And of course, there are many examples that don't involve humans and we'll be looking at plenty of those throughout this course. And the other aspect of biology that we'll be touching upon here is our immune system. I've already mentioned our immune system. Our immune system is an aspect of our biological functioning that is very important to consider in the way that we negotiate relationships with the organisms that live on us and in us and around us. That is what the immune system is all about. Of course, we have relationships with microbial life in our guts. We have bacteria that occupy our intestines that help us to extract certain nutrients from food. And we are constantly negotiating those relationships through the chemistry that I've already mentioned, through those molecules. We are negotiating those relationships with the bacteria in our gut. We are providing two things to, to those bacteria in terms of this domestication process. We are providing food and shelter. And in turn, they provide us with food, right? They provide us with certain nutrition that we would otherwise not be able to extract from the food so that's a, another example of a trade-off a deal involving a kind of domestication um, in that case between us and the bacteria in our gut but it also includes this aspect of immune function because we have to negotiate with those bacteria that we have inside of us we have to negotiate a relationship where they are not causing inflammation and that involves setting up certain barriers you've probably heard of the leaky gut syndrome where some of those bacteria actually get into your bloodstream that can cause inflammation that can cause a triggering of the immune system so we have to find ways to negotiate so that those bacteria remain in the places where they need to be within our bodies and that those barriers both physical 
and immunological and that is to say those barriers that involve like the physical structure of the gut and also those immune cells that would go and find any bacteria that finds its way out of the gut all of those things are part of the way that we negotiate our relationship to the world through our immune systems and of course we're realizing now with the pandemic that our immune systems may also be seen to expand into the ecosystem. In fact, the whole ecosystem may be conceived of as part of our immune system. If we disrupt that ecosystem, if we disrupt the dynamic equilibria that exists within climax ecosystems, then these diseases will emerge and will enter our bodies. So by keeping preserving, conserving our forests, our natural world. We are also protecting ourselves. We are part of that ecosystem. That ecosystem is part of our immune system. So we'll be exploring this relationship in much greater depth throughout this course.